Why We Bleep is sponsored by Signal Sounds. Like Jamie Liddell, we all want a little bit more kit. Yes, even though it took four carloads to transmit the hellscape of wires and Japanese boxes that I've spent the large majority of my life accumulating, I too want a little bit more. And for those needs, there is Signal Sounds. Fresh, warm, reekin rich, interesting deep cuts are now available. Like the Sputnik Spectral Processor, designed by Roman Filipov of Deckhard's Dream fame, and based on Don Buchler's original work, the Quittering Guitari Ace Video Synth. You feed it audio and M1D1 signals, and it produces spectacular video in sync with your wiggles. They've also got the SSF triptych, of course, that mad BBD flanger filter and distortion module that's come from the minds of SSF, Boys Noise, and Basic. And that's how you know it's good. They've got the ALM system coupe. That's the ALM mega system back in stock with the squid sampler just itself got a very nice firmware update, adding the ability to rotate outputs along with many other things. Does Matthew ever sleep? Will he continue to add new features to the squid sampler until he is a dried up husk? I think so. And finally, Evan T Day. Even tied. Imagine Jamie Liddell singing through an ultra tap, which is being fed into a micro pitch, which is running through a rose and into a H9. You probably couldn't really hear what he was singing anymore, but we would try it out if he ever came to our shop because we've got them all in stock and we like him a lot, so he's welcome to come and have a go. So if you're actually Jamie Liddell himself, or even if you're not, navigate your pointing unit via the infinite screen of distraction to signalsounds.com. That website is signalsounds. Dot com. Why? Hi, Fitched Ian, as they say in Scotland, where I'm not. I'm in Leeds. Yes, I've moved house. I was in the middle of the countryside, in between homes, you might say, and now I'm in my home. I suppose you could call it a home. It's a bit more like a sort of hipster cafe because there's just lots of wooden boards and exposed brickwork everywhere, and there is really nice coffee and the synthesizers, but it is a bit annoying, like a hipster cafe, (laughs) because there's not a lot of space. Well, depends on the cafe, but in this one, there isn't a lot of space. I'm a bit in between spaces. I don't have a dedicated studio, and so things are a bit tricky to make content, let me tell you that. Nonetheless, we have a podcast, and it's not just any podcast. It's a Marks and Spencers podcast (laughs) with Jamie Liddell, himself a podcaster, but particularly himself, an amazing, wonderful musician. I became aware of Jamie Liddell through the wonderful tunes that he made. A little bit more, a little bit more, I think is probably one of my favourites. That's just funky as shit, as they say. And Jamie is just a very funky and wonderful human. I'm sure you probably, if you listen to this podcast, are aware of his Hanging With Audio Files podcast which is very, very good, uh, which he recently interviewed Alessandro Cortini. Don't even worry about it. It's a wonderful podcast, combining sort of techie stuff. He goes into the, like, nitties, talking about all the details of how to do sounds, like techniques and tips. It's like a jam-packed show and then an amazing interview. Um, But yeah, Jamie is just a wonderful human being and also a complete dweeb when it comes to gear. He is an absolute gear hound, a bloodhound for gear. And we do talk indeed about his bloodhoundedness. We all want a little bit more when it comes to equipment. 
And so, yeah, Jamie, we talked about a great many things and it's a kind of free flowing conversation where I was just sort of, there were touch points I wanted to get to and we just kind of naturally got to them. Um, but amongst the sort of, you know, along the way, we talk about the Circlon, we talk about how to make a deadline that sticks. I have a really evil way of doing that, which you may enjoy. The power of being told you can't do something, the power of the sampler punk power, in fact, that Jamie talks about, which I think is a brilliant description of the sampler. And of course, we talk about having too much gear and things like the Strager and his Surge Poly that he's created, which is an amazing contrabulation um, and many other things. It's a good chat. And so I think we should get into it. It's a long one. But first, we have just one more sponsored message from this amazingly wonderful company. Why We Bleep is also sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creative and curious people like you. Offering thousands of inspiring video-based classes on a multitudinous array of topics like illustration, graphic design, music production, animation, film, video, writing, productivity, the list, it is long. But the glasses are short. With most classes being under 60 minutes, there are lessons to fit any schedule. I like drawing, so I was curious to try out Illustrated Journaling, 14 Days of Prompts by Dylan Mazwinski. It's designed to get you off your butt and then back onto your butt to draw something new every day for two weeks. Nice to start redeveloping a creative habit, Miss Park. So if you're curious to try Skillshare yourself, as well you may be, given it is less than $10 per month with a yearly subscription, I have a deal for you. The first 1,000 people who click the link in my description get themselves a free trial of Skillshare Premium. So when you're done with the pod, click the link and learn yourself some new skills. And now it is time to multiply my need to have a little bit more Jamie Liddell. Thanks. What was it? I was reading about the making of uh, Kiss and they were talking about how they were were they flying? And he was sort of, he was writing it kind of in his mind as he went. And he's one of those people, I always, I'm always suspicious that every other musician has this ability that they write songs ahead of time. And they sort of come to the studio like, right, I know what I want. And it's like, this, 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 get this ready and we'll, we'll do it. But he actually did that. No, Is that true? I mean, you know, I'm not going to, I would speculate that it is true. Let's be honest, he's more than capable. Yeah. He was more than capable of that kind of behaviour. Yeah. I just love that from speaking with Susan Rogers about that era when he'd just turn up and the song would be done in a day. They'd just record the music and he'd do the vocals and any overdubs that were necessary and that's it. They hit record and he never went back. Didn't go and mix it separately. Didn't kind of think, right, well, we've got a good version of that to mix later it's like no pull down the faders pull them up they had apis and good stuff wherever they were whether it was the rehearsal whether you know they had the good stuff so they could just do a mix and he wasn't that bothered about you know really really anal fidelity questions and stuff yeah he just wanted to get the idea down and like you know that worked didn't it yeah <laughs> because when you look at his output you think how on earth is it possible for anyone to do an album a year and a world tour and two like feature films you know what i mean 85 and 86 like he did purple rain and under the cherry moon and he did <laughs> the albums of course and toured them it's like well the way that happens is every day you're in the studio you write and finish a song and it probably will be, you know, when Doves Cry on Monday, turn up on Tuesday, Starling Nikki, like Wednesday. You know what I mean? It's like, it's absolutely unthinkable, but something to strive for, I guess. <laughs> A focus. Where did, I mean, where did his drive come from? 
Do we? Does anyone know where that that sort of work ethic came from? It's a good question. I, I mean, I think you know, being short and being sort of you know a massive you know like his brother was uh, you know there's that kind of rivalry and he has it, it was he had it with sports and i think anything you know he just wanted to win he's one of those characters i just from what i understand he's just what if you played ping pong he'd play really intensely mm. and want to win at that and it's just that winning mindset i think it's a good question where does it come from it's some kind of complex <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> like early <laughs> yeah he failed at something or he had a hard parent or maybe it's funny know. to think of it as a failing isn't it because it's sort of you know how does winning end up being failing because he did so much great stuff but definitely not without consequence but anyway yeah man Oh, it's good to good to see you, man. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I know we had all these tech worries and straight into it. I love I love how it all get always gets straight in, and that's the way. It should Absolutely. Be. Um, well, it's nice to be seen. I can't. I mean, I know what you look like. So, and I saw a brief snippet, can, like mixed with the sort of sound of the um, oh yeah, of the Imperial probe <laughs> droid, uh, which if you need it for a nitty, it's like uh, know, yeah, they go really I've got good full like Ring modded, <laughs> like uh, man, 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 sort of vibe. I'm, um, I am excited. Uh, I think t- 2021 is the year that I will become an ARP 2600 owner. Which is, oh, uh, you're getting the mini one. Yes. Ah, oh, well I'm done. Getting a mini. Have you got? A, have you got a 2600? I haven't. I borrowed one off. Uh, yeah, off Pat Carney actually of the Black Keys. That's a good one. He has a really cool one. It's modded. It's like got all the envelope speed mods and it's a really good one uh oh it's so good i mean what is the mod is it are they slow envelopes i mean they kind of thwap don't they or is it yeah even faster envelopes yeah really yeah an even zappier r2d2 impression exactly yeah yeah it's even zappy no they are amazing the 2600s aren't they they're so i was upset a little bit when i had it <laughs> do you mean because you had to give it back yeah i was just upset by how good it was i was a little bit like ah oh, come on this is ridiculous i mean yeah good for you you're going to make that thing sing i, hope so. I mean this is i love what you do with synths is because you always bring out you know you always gravitate quickly to the music and yeah and uh, that's just such a a welcome thing it definitely keeps me on my toes just in terms of like getting stuff and thinking, what is the point of this thing? What was I trying to do with it? Was I trying to just, I mean, I like the idea of having days when you've got nothing in mind other than pure exploration, but it's funny, isn't it? Being a dad and having such limited time, you think, okay, I could explore the whole night, you know, that's fair use of time, but at the same time, <laughs> you know. Time is limited. Yeah, these four hours are, that's it, that's all i got, and I've got to make it work. Is that something that you're, I'm not to ask too many questions of you, but I mean, um, <laughs> how's that going? Well, it's, I think you're absolutely right. It's like, if you, I talked to, I talked to a bit of a name drop, I talked to Booty about this, and but he, something he said really resonated. He's like, I make time for fooling around I, I have it where i make videos and i'm like well there's nothing for me to make a video about because i haven't done any experimentation that should lead you know i haven't discovered anything new or right. do you know what i mean and, and it's that but do you have like are you how does it work what does your day actually look like have you got like a, a full day for it or do you have to balance it with fatherly duties Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I tend to do everything at night at the moment, which I'll be honest is not, even though I like the night time. And I do remember reading a while back that Nigel Godridge once interviewed about his work style was like nothing good ever happens before dinner time, which I quite liked. It gave me a little bit of faith in my current way, because there is that beautiful thing about, you know, you know that mundane day-to-day things will interrupt less at night people won't call about you know plumbing or (laughs) you're not going to get those kind of interruptions at least so i like that the psychic energy of the nighttime i like but also you know the realities you're also knackered sometimes at night you're like oh god time to turn on the creativity let's go it's like, oops, the battery's down to like 20% and you're supposed to be carving out 
some amazing innovation. Sometimes it's just a bit like, it's one of the modern conditions, isn't it? It's like you've just got to go a bit easier on yourself. If you've not got the juice, then don't force it because it's just going to end up making you feel bad about yourself. Like, why aren't I delivering like, you know, I, like I used to or whatever. Like, you know, it's definitely a nighttime's only kind of affair for me right now. And, um, and now aside for this, you know, this is, this is nice. I mean, yeah, if I can make plans to do stuff, then yeah, I will. But man, typically nights. Is that because you are literally, do you, you spend time with the family and then you're like, shit, I've got to do something today. And it's like, it's, <laughs> it's eight o'clock or like, how do, yeah. you, do you have a structured day in that sense? Mm, I mean, like I say, like basically every night I come into the studio and, uh, and spend about um, four or five hours uh, pursuing whatever it might be, a current obsession, some kind of podcast action, or um, a little bit of music or piano practice. Yeah, I mean, I tried actually a little bit of BT style, sort of 17-minute blocks that were kind of cycling around on my phone with alarms. So every 17 mm. minutes it would bleep me and I'd look on a piece of paper and go, oh, it's time to do the washing up now for 17 minutes. So I'd go into the kitchen and do that. And then the next bit would be like practice piano. So it's kind of like almost all the things that sort of building up in the anxiety part of my brain of like, you haven't done this, you haven't done that. I can sort of list all of those things and go, well, if I break all those tasks up and I can sort of hit them all, then I'm not going to suffer from that energy. It was really good, actually. I mean, that part, it did inspire me. I mean, I'm not quite as um, focused and and disciplined as, as BT by any means. Um, who, who is? Who is, really? BT, yeah. Other than BT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's quite an exceptional sort of work ethic and style. Very unique. Uh, but yeah. I know that, that's, that was interesting. I'd like to get back to that maybe. Um, but, I mean, you know, sometimes things just take time, don't they? It's got to grind it out. You do have to show up. I definitely think that that sort of... I can't remember who said this, but it's like the whole, you know, like real creatives, just, you just, sh- oh, it's Stephen King. He's like, some people wait for inspiration, other people just get to work. And it's like, I definitely agree. <laughs> if, you make, if you make music with the electronic music equipment, I don't really think it's possible to have writer's block unless you're doing something very wrong, because you should just be able, like the whole, for me personally, making music is an experience of just, gravitating to a piece of equipment and then just farting around and the, that, <laughs> that action of farting around sparks something and you go that's cool and then you record it and then you go well what goes with that and then you've made a track i like the idea of stephen king's quote existing and then yours about farting around sort of appearing on the same page because ultimately they're saying the same thing and and, and you know it's, it's basically like yeah wait for inspiration or you know Get your farts going. Get a fart on. <laughs> and Lord knows, there are, I have some high-quality machines for creating farts in this place. <laughs> oh, man. Absolutely. No, it is cool, isn't it? I always think about this. Where you, you come up to an instrument, you know, piano is a great example. You just come up and go, um, oh, let's just, you know, play the most basic of chords. And then just like an idiot almost you're like it's amazing listen you know it's the sort of like the naivety in that sort of child like mind that it always feels like so rich even though it's the same thing you've heard a million times i mean that's the thing that makes you a lifer in music i think is if you just love sound i mean it's kind of it stands to reason but not everyone feels that way i don't think some people are in it for all kinds of reasons for me i'm just so fascinated with sound that it's 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 like you it's it's very easy for me if there's a sound source that has some kind of in any way <laughs> given me something i'm going to explore it and and you know it could be an sk1 it could be a, a dx it could be you know, a surge, it could be a piano, it could be a guitar, it could be a mandolin, it could be a flute. I mean, they're all <laughs> they're all fair game, you know. And then obviously singing, I often forget about singing, really. <laughs> but um, I love doing it. Do you sing spontaneously like, uh, who's that pianist <laughs> who... Uh, oh, yeah. Glenn, Glenn Gould. Gould. Glenn Gould, you're like... Is that true that Glenn, like, would ruin takes because he would sort of hum to himself? Oh, man, it's, I've heard, yeah. 
It sounded pretty terrible when he was doing that. But, uh, <laughs> but my neighbour is a great pianist. This guy Rob Berger, he's awesome. He's he's done so much stuff with Laurie Anderson, and, um, and Lou Reed, wow. all kinds of people. Amazing stories, actually. John's on. Like it's crazy. He just lives literally across the street, and um, yeah, he's the guy who who's lending me the orchestron. He has a little mini Chamberlain that I'm going to borrow off him as well. It's 37 keys. It's like portable. A portable Chamberlain that's not like a Mellotron where the loops start. You know, they go round like the Orchestron. They're kind of on a loop, which is crazy. So anyway, he's got a really a different sort of sound world than me. I feel like I'm like really synthy and he's really organic guy. Um, yeah. yeah, he was telling me about Glenn Gould. <laughs> That really horrible story about Glenn Gould searching his whole life for the ideal piano and finally finding it. You know, you know, someone is insane and we think we're crazy with sound. I mean, Glenn Gould, you know, just was in love with his piano and then when it was being transported to him, it like fell off the back of a lorry, like literally, and like it just like it kind of hurt him for the rest of his life. It kind of I don't think he ever recovered. So he tried to find the replacement to that, or was that the piano? That, that was the one. It was almost as if it was like he found his true love and then it died. It's just fucking awful to think about. I mean, does he not Does he not know about, like, contact libraries or something? <laughs> <laughs> Glenn, there's a felt, felt piano. Yes. Give it a go. It'll sound like Nils Frau. Oh, yeah, yeah. Who? It's, uh, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> it's, it, I like it. We, we've all got our obsessions. And uh, I'm quite glad. I remember watching there's this there's a piano tuner documentary about Steinway. Like, do you ever see that? No. It's also amazing and fascinating and kind of terrifying because <laughs> the tuner guy he, he cannot listen to things out of tune. Oh my so god! So a vast <laughs> amount of music that's been recorded for him is essentially like unlistenable. <laughs> and I was like. Apex you know, it makes me sad. Yeah, definitely. exactly. Aphex is like, I suppose when it's deliberately out, that's all right. I think it's more for him. You know, it's a terrible, I don't wish that on anyone. Does he, does he then love like uh, that, um, you know, just intonation and sort of all the... Good question. Uh, yeah, like right, what's right. the guy that, uh, the really like hardcore kind of minimalist fella, uh, Lamont Young. You know, right, right. Like, tuned the guy. wires guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I, you know, it's interesting because my other neighbours are really fantastic percussionists and stuff. Um, Ji Hei Jung, she's like a tremendous marimba player. And uh, I've been really interested in like marimbas and other things. It's a just intonation. There's a just, I don't know how to say it, a justly tuned, um, justly tempered, tuned. yeah, a right, just okay. tempered uh, marimba um this you know it's a guy currently you know making these things it's awesome that thing it's like laid out in a crazy way like it goes away from you and sort of and it's not just in a line it kind of goes back in three it's like it's longer in in, in the other dimension there's loads of keys just like it's quite intimidating but um this guy playing it is just really quite beautiful i mean something so magic about escaping the scale, isn't there? It's like, ah, oh, freedom. There's so much mm. beauty in these notes. That, you Have know. you played around with um, micro-tuning and sort of other scales much? Not deliberately, really, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the Prophet 5 is cool because it, it has a mode that you can... You know that mode on the Prophet 5? You can, like, boot it, and then the top knobs actually change the tuning of each key. Like, you, there's OD relative to C and so on. Yeah, it's sort of got a tuning mode like that for experimentation. But, uh, yeah, no, it's it's great, isn't it? I mean, here in the early Aphex, it was just... You're either drawn to that or you're not, I suppose. But, yeah, I think the two of us, we're like, that is the business. I, I'm also not aware of which tunes of his are micro-tuned in that sense. I know that a lot of what he does now is, is definitely is, but it's sort of... I just don't... I feel like it's not... It's not been well taught. It's not well understood. There's not a lot of content, quote unquote. I mean, yeah. there probably is. I've just not looked out for it. But it's like, everyone's like, oh, you get Scala. And it's like, <laughs> right, right. What, what do you do once you have Scala? <laughs> do I, how do I make Scala make? Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's, I don't really get the process. There's this Moog, you know, I've got the Model D reissue, the Moogie one. And uh, it's got that boot mode where you can boot in 
at other scales. You can oh, do 17 yes. notes per octave. I think there's one that's 34 or something. That's just greedy. <laughs> it is. It's really <laughs> nuts. But that is good. That's a really handy thing because you can still sort of MIDI it and, and write stuff on it and you can get close enough to the note that you're, you know, used to, as it were, mm. and sort of just deviate a little bit. I mean, you know, pitch bend is giving us access to all of that, isn't it? I mean, you know, those, yeah. those pitch wheels that don't return, like the Model D and stuff. <laughs> if you yes, sort of accidentally true. forget it, but I mean, I suppose, relatively speaking, they're still in tune with each other. But I, I think with Aphex, it seemed like it was more like that Profit 5 thing where everything was in tune except one note. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was like but less think- of the taking a whole scale versus like detuning one note in the octave. And I think, well, I th- certainly looking at the Korg stuff, he's like, he's almost creating his own scales, which I think he feels, right. he feels them out intuitively. It's not like he writes them down on a piece of paper. Yeah, yeah, like, no, totally. Finds one note and it's is like, wonk. Like, like, wonks yeah. the next one, wonks the next one relative. And yeah, I, don't, I just fundamentally don't understand how he makes anything else. But he does seem to be having a kind of knock-on effect because you can sort of tell when a brand has been hit up by Aphex because <laughs> they add in a, in a subsequent firmware update, like uh, firmware update one or two, they add micro-tuning and you right. can sort of tell that there's been an email that's <laughs> caused ripples internally. But <laughs> yeah, although I think it's only just hit the circle on, which is a surprise. But anyway. Has it? Yeah. Have you, do you has, still use yours? Yeah, well, I mean, I've I would be hesitate to say that I use it because, I mean, personally, I've hardly written any music music for for a very long time. But that's because same. I've, but a because uh, you know I don't have a lot. I'm in this sort of like weird limbo point where I'm not in my like final studio, and um, because I'm in between, I've been in between house moves for about two years, and literally before this call. Um, was just finding out that the builders that we've been appointing for the last three months have just pulled out and are like, we can't build oh, your house. you're uh, absolutely or, kidding me. <laughs> it's just like... Seriously. Fuck, so it's, um, I mean, it's it's fine. Like, we've got a house and we can live in it, but it's um, it would have been helpful to have a larger kitchen because... Uh, oh, it was, I'm so we, we sorry, could, man. We could, no, it's fine. And, and, and we will be, I mean, I'm sure either way, one way or another, we'll, we'll, we'll make it work. And either way, I'm going to have to build a studio space in the garden and perhaps it might also mean that I have more of the money to do that now. And then, long story short, is when I've got that all set up, I, I mean, I, you, I think with the circle and you have kind of... You, you can and should have like project ideas for these things and just be like, this is what I'm doing with it. I am doing. And for me, the circle on is, is like, let's explore a hardware ma- way of making music. So I've, I've got back my old Yamaha A4000 sampler that I used to own. Like I've got the actual one back and then assembling a few bits and bobs that I'll use with it and be like, yeah, that's where it really shines. Yeah. Do you, do you sample and do you use it? Are you using hardware samplers with it or do you just literally sequence synths and then print them? Or what do you, how do you use it? Yeah, I know. It, it varies a lot. I mean, um, like, for example, this video I just put up, you know, with the tape machines and stuff, it was really useful for the calibration, the scale calibration, because to scale the CV that was quite a raw CV into a tape machine to kind of quantize it. I, don't, I wouldn't have known quite how to scale that in the same way the circle on offered. It was really quite um, impressive You could because you could do the C to C tuning and kind of get it in a range that was close enough. That was handy. <laughs> I've never used that before, but that was super cool because you can scale each synth. I mean, that's like amazing right there. I mean, I just, I, I always come across new things like that, I suppose, with the circle on is what I mean. I leave mm. it permanently set up. And I like having that DMUX expander because I just plug those trigs into, yeah, an assimilator. I've got the squared sample. Yeah. It's got one of those Q, QDs from VPME. Yes. Uh, yeah. So you got that. Really, really great. I just love, and he's great. Um, Vlad is so cool. Vlad. And, yeah. He's super sweet. Yeah. Um, I was um, on that beta thing with the, um, you know, the S2400, the Isla thing, and he's he's actually building that machine with... A guy Mickey who did the Arturia drum brute and stuff. Mm. So on the on the on the old chats with them, like just seeing his dry humour. He's a, he's a, he's an odd bird. I love him. <laughs> yeah, uh, so yeah, I don't know. The the circle is cool. I mean, I, yeah, I did this thing a while back where I, I spread out all the CV channels like a lot, 
like in a way where I had a layer for velocity, I had a layer for, you know, different ways to control the sound. It was quite involved. <laughs> it was quite a faff. And I was like, yes. this is a lot of faff. I don't need <laughs> to do this. It's not helping. But I just sort of wanted to prove that I could do it. And I think there's that kind of aspect to it where it's like, yeah, you can do it. You can totally do this. And I like the timing. And, and sometimes I just find it like super inspiring and, and at other times I find it super frustrating I think it's sort of like hits in the middle but I've got it synced mm. to that Acme clock thing so the computer sends a sends an audio clock to the Acme and that downstream like controls the circle on it behaves really well it like mm. it really takes that signal well and so yeah I like it as a solid piece something that I can really rely on that can do a lot of things uh, so I use it as sort of a Swiss army knife, really. Just MIDI routing, like sometimes recording little mini patterns, sometimes doing a lot, sometimes doing not very much. It's sort of like a nice guy to have around with the Eurorack, mm. just to interface it with the computer, I think. That's sort of how I think of it, it's sort of an extension of of programming from from the computer. But um, It is a faff, though. It is quite a faff. It's it quite is, a faff. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's it's because you're. it's like walking into a sort of... Um, I don't know, it's like walking into a sort of company or something where they've got like loads of structure and the way they like things done and you're like, oh, I wasn't planning on doing it like that. Like, no, I think this is how, you, how you're going to be doing it. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, like, some oh. things are super easy and amazing. Like, I really like setting, i tell you what's really fun, I found at least, is setting up like just a, a regular, not a CK pattern, but just one of the monophonic patterns or whatever and just playing and letting it record on top of itself. And just sort of like um, just replacing notes as you go, but yeah. just playing live. And I just love that note stealing thing that was happening when I was playing with a polysynth or like a, and just that was, I just loved that. I just thought that was so fun. And, and, and I don't know why, but it's not the kind of thing you can do quite the same with Ableton. So there's a few things I just sort of, I've really gravitated to and just, and I, I keep exploring it and learning more about it. And I do love it. It's great. But I, I do just get the Metropolis, you know. And so it's just such a different world, isn't it? It's just like, yeah. that's that beautiful far to bow and something good will happen box, isn't it? It really, I'm like, I've got it right here and it's, I was just messing with it. And the accumulator thing is just amazing. I mean, you've got that in the circle on. You have indeed. Um, but apparently stolen from the Latronic Notron, Notron or whatever, the, oh. uh, the weird, which is sort of uh, infamously known as Darth Vader's toilet seat, which is like one of the, <laughs> the weirdest sort of British sequences from a kind of that, from that weird middle era of like the, you know, the 90s, oh, yeah. where there was kind of like analogue wasteland. And there were the sort of hardcore people like Smaug, like totally, sitting, sitting on their 909s and totally. 303s. And then, but there were some devices like the Notron or Notron, which are, and it's, it's a sequencer, but it's, it looks so weird. It's got, it has no hard edges. It's all like, it's like curved. It was like, what were you thinking? It's like um, a pod, like the kidney. Oh, yeah, yeah, like the Line 6 pod. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, like, odd designs that, that seem cool in the 90s. Um, um, so, that I mean, there is this sort of, there are a few of those bits of kit that are, like, really well respected. And it does feel a bit like the circle on's born from them, but I agree with you, it is an absolute faff. But with that said, it's just one of those faffs that I think if you can sort of, if you can just commit the time then you've got you build the muscle memory and you then become fluid and fast with it you know and it's clear i like the way that it can give it can get you out of one of the things that used to frustrate me a lot with the eurorack was the very short loops that tend to that used to really hold me back um yeah. making anything more than just like begiddle wing begiddle wing begiddle <laughs> wing it's just like yeah I've made a lot of techno in my time. It's cool, but I wouldn't mind it being a four-bar phrase. Yeah. And then it's kind of four a nightmare bar, sometimes mean. to get a four-bar phrase with things. It's like that I really liked in the circle on where you can just make a one-bar phrase that has the mm. same joy of, of that rush, but then you can quickly copy the pattern and change the last one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or yeah, transpose it. And it's just like, yep, that is really good. That's mm. super handy. And I th it really, it just, it, it's kind of, I think, by, ma by when Colin made it so open and so capable, it does force you into thinking, like, like you're saying, like, what am I trying to get out of this? How do I do it? Don't get distracted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> do the thing, make it do the thing, and use other boxes for farting about more than that. 
Or if you're going to fart about, do it like this and see if that works. But I think if you approach it with quite discipline and kind of go, I want a four bar phrase and I kind of wanted to do this and do this. How am I going to achieve that? I got really into trying to make Raymond Scott stuff and just make simple phrases that would transpose and it's, it's great for that <laughs> yeah 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 back to yeah exactly or like but that's quite a long phrase you know what i'm saying it's yeah, like, it's like yeah, okay. and then it's sort of like thinking of of you know thinking of music as like interwoven patterns i mean the circle is tremendous at that it's very, very good at it. I think you have to just, yeah, not expect it to be something it's not. I mean, obviously, it's that just reason, you have to come to it. It's the problem, yeah. like, and and that, <laughs> and in a, a time-starved world, you know, where musicians are sort of haven't got a lot of time and kind of want things just to be easy. Like, I thought I would just get this and become Apex Twin. And it's like, what do you mean I have to learn it? Like, it's like mm. and it yeah. is deep. And it, I mean, it comes with for those who don't know, for those of you who don't don't want that, it's got it comes with a booklet that looks like it should accompany a sort of oscilloscope from the sort of the night, and it's like a ring bound a ring binder that explains you know how to do it and then the ring binder is out of date by the way because the firmware and only via clandestine means partially do you understand that you have to go on sort of forums and give them a password and then then you get the latest firmware that's got all of these updates that colin you know has been doing anyway it's like sort of a it's a club it is a bit of a club isn't it and it's, there's a lot to be said for just like it's that sense of belonging but, but with that said it's just sort of. I was very grateful for um, this chap, Split Radix, who oh, yeah. has put up, who he is. Who is that? I see him coming around. So that chap is a guy called Stephen Henley, who is in Dublin and basically is a musician, and he has a phenomenal collection of music equipment. Uh, he has a, a good job and right, he's right, invested right. it wisely <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, in in manifesting his studio. But basically, he's a Circlon fanatic, and he's used it for probably more than 10 years. And That's so, right. He's been doing videos recently. Good ones. Really good videos. If you go back to the first ones, you'll see that he says, like, that Mylar Melody said, please put up a, a video. That's my impression of him. Like, it's sounding it's, yeah, yeah, it's Wogan, acceptable. Uh, it's acceptable. really uh, the best I could do of, um, you know, the Circlon. So, and he did, to his enormous and massive credit. <laughs> he actually listened to me. Yeah, And yeah, I was like, yeah. do it. And he's, there's no, there is no better video series for learning the circle. On. Agreed. And it does require time because it is like they, you know, if you watch them all, it's like eight hours or whatever. But that's how long it takes to explain, and and at least they exist. But yeah, it's I'm with you. It's sort of there's a lot to be said for just immediate devices, and it's uh, I, I was talking to someone who's developing a sequencer only today, and you know he was you know one of the strengths of his sequencer is that it goes beyond the sort of immediate and in his defense he's designing something to be very immediate and yet be allow for arrangement style things but i did reflect to myself i was like you know as musicians we accept this vast limitations all in the sake of immediacy like so it's that sort of idea that immediacy is what is valuable and so um I don't really know where I'm going with that. It's just, but it's the idea that we we almost we willingly want dumb tools to to get quick results, and we'll just work with dumb tools and be happier than than complex. I suppose ones. the the uh, the alternative, and I suppose it's coming, is uh, you know all these literally so called intelligent tools. You know the magenta projects of the world, who you know and those AI kind of. Music helpers, almost. <laughs> but then I always remember, like, there was a... For a while, there was a family living across the way. Their kid was really excited, saying, oh, I, I make music too, you know, because I was talking about being a musician. He's like, yeah, come check it out. So I went to check him out, and he was using, you know, garage band and just pulling in loops. <laughs> and it's these big old loops, and I was just like... The thing is, it's like building Lego with, like, massive bricks. It's like, yeah, mm. you've got a thing, but you only used four bricks. It's basically not really doing the thing. I'm sorry. It might be convenient and quick, <laughs> but you're not really making music. <laughs> Did and you sort of stand over him like... Jamie Liddell's like, no, this isn't... Me. This is terrible. <laughs> I've slaved for years. 
<laughs> yeah. Kids weeping openly. Yeah, I need to see some pain. I mean, yeah, uh, like, <laughs> but, you know, but that's it. I think our obsession with convenience is actually arguably a bad thing. You know what I mean? I think it, it, I think we might need to work for it uh, to get new stuff. So bring it on. Isn't it? You know, isn't it hard enough? Like even uh, and the, the the challenge of of knowing what's good is surely that's the hardest challenge of all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that is kind of there's that beauty of I think when I started out my career, like um, my first record. Like well, my early vinyl releases are about in about ninety five um, with Subhead, and like that was two other guys, Phil Wells and Jason Leach, and it really taught me a lot because I had all the skills, quote unquote, of making music because I'd learned in my bedroom since I was sixteen how to use Cubase and an S nine fifty and a MIDI Verb three in my early setup, whatever. I could make tracks. And so when it came time to make tracks, as it were, with these others, I could do the kind of um, the technical thing of like, yeah, yeah, I know how to do that. We'll do this. And now oh, that gives me an idea to do this. And, you know, all of a sudden I was in a studio that had a 909 and like loads more gear than I ever had and a decent desk. And I was really growing into this new setup. But it was also their taste of like saying like, no, nah, no, nah, but that's just not cool, you know. <laughs> it shouldn't be so busy like like let's make it like this and like th that taste making and that guidance and that simplicity and that taste like you're saying it was critical like it changed everything it just made me make music that was way more i don't know satisfying and actually landed and actually was finished and i needed them i needed them to sort of teach me what i knew almost and to sort of bring it into focus and that kind of I don't know I feel like that's really important sometimes you may know how to do things but it's a question of like um yeah yeah almost like is it good though <laughs> yeah it's like always that constant thing of like yeah you can you're doing a lot of things but what kind of like what's what's the thing what's where are you going with this and, and what are you trying to sound like and do you like it? You know, <laughs> it's like mm. sometimes the simple questions you forget to ask. You're just like, I'm doing my thing. I'm doing this thing. It's like, do I like it? Um, but anyway, this, it, I think sometimes when you're making music that feels comfortable, you get that initial thing of like, yeah, I'm doing a thing that sounds really good, you know? And when you get into certain other styles, you're more liable to say, I don't know. When, when I was making super collider stuff with Christian Vogel, oftentimes we'd finish a track and both look at each other and go, I don't know, is it good? I mean, is do we like it even? Didn't actually have an answer to that. And it was weird. And I think ultimately that was a good sign because we were kind of pushing ourselves way out of our comfort zone. But there is that other danger of just like always sticking to the thing you do. And like, yeah, you get the kind of rush of like, I'm doing the thing I do. But, you know that might <laughs> it might not be the greatest way to find new shit, you know. Well, you stagnate, don't you? Yeah. I mean, do you, I mean, are you conscious of that? Like, when you make it, what is your process for making an album as well? Do you say, I've done this before, so I won't do that again? <laughs> no. Because do I don't do that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I haven't made an album since 2016. I mean, I've, I've, I've had all kinds of motives. I've been through different motives. I've uh, been through really experimental mindsets and just wanted to do something for a friend. You know, when I made Muddling Gear, I was really making that record for my friend, Hardy Finn, who was running Spy Mania at the time. And I just wanted to do something that, you know, he would like ultimately, <laughs> that he would be like excited by, that would like have enough range and would have enough like, you know a freakiness to appeal to his to mindset and his labels aesthetic you know i wanted it to fit the labels brand in a way and sort of and and that gave me a lot of license because it, that brand was very free and very open it kind of it made my mind expand and that i liked that you know so that suited me then and when i made you know multiply it was definitely more of a a focus towards songs because i actually truly had become a bit sick of being so out you know 
and everything was so noisy and everything was so fast and 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 so edited and it was really like that time of faster it was like a bit of a boys club space race of everything electronically becoming you know what i mean notes per second almost drill 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 and bass and just like I wanted songs. I realized that I was missing that and I truly love that. So I kind of went back to that. So yeah, I suppose, you know, not to give too rambling an answer to this question, but it's really just about like asking what I'm into right now, like what I'm missing almost, like what am I missing? Like I'm right now I'm missing sort of singing, I suppose, but I don't want to just do it the way I've done it before. I kind of want to... Yeah not just for the sake of doing something different i truly don't want to sing like that anymore i kind of feel like there's another way that i've not explored that i've kind of held back and maybe i just wasn't ready for before this i don't know there's a lot of levels to it but um at the same time i just haven't made that much music recently which is a bit weird i have making a lot of sound <laughs> But, I don't know. think that's inherently a bad thing. Like, I don't know if you're like me, where I've, uh, I mean, I had, like I say, I haven't really made a lot of music. I made bits. I mean, there's, there's things that I've messed with, and I've been playing with tools, things like Endless and stuff, where you oh, can't yeah. help but make music. <laughs> yeah, right. So, in a sense, I have been, you know, but I haven't been finishing tracks, and I don't have a folder. But I do think, I think it all contributes i mean that sounds like an excuse though the kind of person who doesn't finish tunes but <laughs> but I, I, right. I know that i know i have it in me and i know that i'm still capable of it and I, there is also that argument that the time that you that you're not writing music you might just be living your life and it's and the, the, the <laughs> right. life lived will help inform oh music. that's crucial absolutely crucial yeah yeah and i mean that's that is a great truth I think, you know, it's almost like when you're young, you can kind of get away with like really spending all that time in the studio. And as you get a bit older, you do need to balance it out because... <laughs> you run out can, of stuff to write songs yeah, about. Yeah, <laughs> no, totally. I mean, it's a room. bit dull, yeah, just talking about, yeah. It, I mean, it really does come back down to, and maybe this is what gets a bit more daunting uh, for me, at least, um, comes down to the thing that differentiates, I've done a lot of co-writing. That's been a relatively new thing for me over the last few years. I've had my hand in some pretty big pop productions, for example, like, you know, not that that's really where my heart is, but I just was kind of curious what that experience would be like because I'm pretty capable of um, doing the vocal thing, like in terms of leading a song, writing the melodies, and oh, I'm, I'm pretty good at that. Yeah, um, I, I feel confident in that, at least. Um, I've never been particularly great with the lyrics. Like, um, I can do it if I'm in the right frame of mind. But I think that's the thing that kind of gives me the most pause these days, is like what I would like to really add <laughs> lyrically mm. to the world, what I'm trying to say. And I think that's what's differentiated for me the great artists I've worked with or maybe the ones that just faded away is that they never really had anything to say. They they liked to be in music for some reasons. But you'd think of someone like Bowie or whatever, he he evolved and was a great example of natural evolution from passion and a lot of factors, but he always had something to say. Mm. You know what I mean? Like that's that's the true artistry that I think kind of holds the example for me all the time is like um what would bowie do or whatever you know but well, so would you're in about it wouldn't he he wouldn't it didn't just magically appear like you he isn't showing you all his mistakes and all of his sort of absolutely in between it's like you know we, we were talking about prince and it's like does for all of you know you know all of the tunes that are finished are they not are they not the the mistakes are they not tunes where he's like nah it's shit oh it's loads <laughs> I, mean, the vault, I mean the vault isn't full of gems let's be exactly. honest exactly well, otherwise they lot. wouldn't be in the vault yeah know? yeah i mean i i, I like this story about bowie like uh, getting started on a new record for him for example i have heard and i might be getting this wrong but i think this is basically the gist of it that he he would the metaphor of walking into the water till it's up to your neck you know what i mean and then just thinking, all right, I have, I, I mean, I'm out of my depth, literally. Like, now's a good time to start. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like, I don't know how to do this. I don't know what I'm doing almost. Yeah. Like, that is a weird 
like thing. I think a, a true re- someone who reaches for that, um, you know, level of, of creativity, and you've got to have that fearlessness of like you're going to be shit when you start on something mm. new. You're going to just, but that beginner's mind will guide you through, and you can use all the things you've learned along the way, but. I think you have to put yourself in uncomfortable situations if you're going to grow. I mean, it's just one of those things, isn't it? Unquestionably. I mean, I'm I'm literally right now going through a sort of job change, and I'm kind of, I've, yeah. I've got I've been working the same job for like more than ten years, and I'm wow. like, and it's I'm like, oh shit! Like I knew what I was doing, you know. And it's that old chestnut of it was very comfortable. It's like a dressing gown. Yes, exactly. And it's like, but I know I can't grow if I don't you know, do something different. It's absolutely true. And it's, I, the tricky thing with music is that often when you don't have someone needling, you know, if you're a solo artist, you don't have a producer, do you? Or, do, you know, there's no, you're not a life coach. It's not like there's not someone going to come and say, you know, hey, Jamie, you're like, you, you need to mix this up. Like, yeah, but you know what? I, I would say, like, uh, I think that can and has for me, um, I am, unfortunately, one of those people that kind of does need to be under the gun a little bit. (laughs) Well, I think we all do. Yeah, and when I'm left to my own devices, it is Noodle City, you know. So it's like, if someone says, hand it in on Tuesday or else, I'm like, oh, I've got it finished. I did it all last night. I mean, geez. (laughs) I haven't made an album for five years, but somehow I managed to knock this one out fully mixed in an evening. (laughs) So it's like, it is amazing what... Yeah, the demands of and the expectations of other people, especially people you respect. I mean, I've I've worked a little bit with Matthew Herbert, and he had that technique of um, booking a mastering session and sort of oh. paying for it, like <laughs> and going, "Look, I've got to have it done by this date. I've already booked the session." That's amazing. Yeah, just sort of <laughs> things like that. Just, yeah, just sort of doing things like that to sort of force the process, even if you haven't got literally a person saying like a record label, I suppose, classically, just going, hey, we need the product or whatever. I mean, that can be a good thing. People are in this day and age are like, why do you need a record label? Sometimes it's just that. Structure. <laughs> that could actually be worth a lot. I think, mm. to be honest, I'd benefit from that. I'd, having a label right now, I would probably finish a record if they were like breathing down my neck about it. Mm. <laughs> it's horrible, but you've got to know yourself, haven't you? You've got to just know this, that's the way I am, you know? I'm exactly the same. Yeah. In fact, so much so that I recently, well, I was doing the, um, I do these ads for Skillshare, which is the sort of, Skillshare is a learning platform. I watched, <laughs> I, I genuinely watched the videos on Skillshare and I watched this. It Are was, you doing no, an This ad isn't now? an ad right now because I'm not, yeah. <laughs> I'm doing mid-rolls now, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. but I, I just sneak them in organically. <laughs> uh, no, this is not an ad for Skillshare. Although it does involve something I did watch on Skillshare, which is probably <laughs> in a meta way is yeah. making this no, like no. the ultimate ad. It um, is. This is but, the ad they want. Oh, God, they're in my head, James. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they're making me sell even when I'm trying not to. In this thing, there was basically this productivity guy, and he was like, oh, you know, I, blah, blah, blah. It's like, thing about productivity. But there was one thing he mentioned where there was like, what? Yeah, Some reason, mate. Blah, 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 productivity. Yeah. <laughs> but within it, he mentioned this thing called B-Minder. And I was like, and he's like, I use Beeminder and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, what's Beeminder? And I Googled it. And I was like, Beeminder. And I was like, holy fuck. So with friends of mine, I conceived something once where I was like, I want to finish a project and I'm going to finish this. And the way that I'm going to do it is I am going to make a 500 pound bet with you that if I don't finish on this day, I will pay you 500 pounds. I won't give it to charity. I won't do anything positive with it. I won't make feel good about it in any way. I'll feel bad because I've given it to you and and (laughs) you don't deserve it. And it's, and, and I made that bet and I kept it because the last thing you want to do, and when you've shaken on it, you're like, it's a deal. You know, the last thing you want to do is renege. And so, um, you, I mean, you can't get out of it. And basically, B-Minder is that. It's like a, it's a website where you put in your credit card details, you put in an agreed sort of thing. You say, I am going to deliver X value by X date. And so you could say to B-Minder, I'm going to, you know, master a project by this date or you could say i'm gonna get up at six o'clock in the morning 
every day. And you can also set it on Beeminder so that if you don't log it by 6.05 a.m., then you get a strike. And if you get a strike, it's a $5 gets removed from your account. The next day, where you, if you get a strike, it's 10 20, Whoa. 40, 60, 80, and then it, it spirals, and then, then it's like so an upper James Brown. It's, it is, yeah. Docking. If you make a mistake, I dock you. <laughs> yes, yeah. literally. It's docking. It's like... So it's like the spirit of James Brown is oh. like, but guess what? It works. Like negative, and I've read about like positive feedback. You know, if you say, "Hey, if right. I if I master this project by this day, I will let myself buy a Nintendo <laughs> Switch," and it's like you've got all the toys you nah, want. Exactly, you've got everything. You've got a family. You've got a great life. Like you don't need incentives. Like you're happy. What you need are negatives. You that need, is hilarious. You, you need that, a boat. Yeah, yeah. No, that so, totally like, makes sense. And have you actually you followed through this? Yes, I have. You have really? Yeah, I have. What, uh, what, what are the things? I mean, is so it I, like... I've, t- I have two B-minders at the moment. One is, um, and I'm, I'm not ashamed to say this, but I'll say it, is to get up before 7am every day. And, and yeah. that should be a shameful thing to a parent because that means there's another parent that's getting up before 7am every day. But I've been really bad with it. And it's because I've crept my... Just like you, I've stayed up late to do my music. And what I discovered oh, yeah. is that you can get up early and do music if you're if you do get out get on with it. And once you've got through the initial fog, you'll find that you're fresher because it's the morning and you've slept. So it's really? all right. Do you, do you tend to favour that then now? I've like the times where you if you can do it and if you have had enough sleep, and that, that is a prerequisite, you've got to yeah. have gotten yeah, like yeah six to eight hours sleep you know there's no getting around that but if you can and if you can get through the initial fog then you have the same situation with nighttime working because you've got no one's up no one's pressuring you no one's calling you no one's and it's and yet you're mentally defogged because you've slept so it yeah. is really good it, it it is a solution is you get the sort of 6 a.m to kind of 9 a.m stretch and then you can achieve something it might be difficult, different if you're self-employed. And you're, Don't you, you know. find that time moves quick in the morning? This has always been something. I always find it, it's great time, but I'm like, geez, I don't, I mean, this, it seems to zip on by somehow. <laughs> I just find that's a weird thing. I mean, it happens at night too, to be honest, but a um, bit different. There are certainly there's times where I've been like, you know, we're on our fourth cup of tea and we've like, you know, we watched some Hey Dougie and we've done this and we've like played with that and we've done this and we've had porridge. I look at my watch and it's 7.30 and I was like, yeah, oh, yeah, shit, yeah, I thought yeah, it was yeah, like, yeah. do you know oh, what I mean? God, absolutely. Like those mornings. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But yeah, it's, um, if you can get up early, I, I have to say I'm, and I've read about, you know, I've been reading these books about sleep and there are night owls, you know, there are, and there are morning larks. There are people who really can't go to sleep earlier. But I think you kind of know unequivocally, like, like if you've ever tried to go to sleep at 10 and succeeded, then you're probably not a night owl. Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? If yeah. you've ever, even it's people who are like almost pathologically can't sleep where it's like, you know, it's, and so... But will be mind allow you to hurt yourself? Because I'm thinking you could say, I want to go to bed after 2 a.m. and wake up before 7, otherwise, you know what I mean? You could just, like, deliberately say, I'm going to, like, not get enough sleep. You can link BeMinder to other services, so you can link it to Apple Health. So you could literally have it so that you statistically have to log exercise within a certain parameter or and that data will will, will yeah. carry and corroborate that. Interesting. Yeah, man. I never would have thought of that. I'm not sure I'm ready to give it a go, but I, I may. Well, you know, I can only show you the door. You know, you have to walk through it. <laughs> the first stage is admitting you have a problem. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, no, that's that's it. I would, I would, I would like to. Yeah, it is funny, isn't it? They, there are those things like you mentioning with your job and time flying by and thinking, "Wow, I'm still doing this," and it's okay, but. Um, you know, those awful questions that used to throw me so much in interviews. It was like, where do you see yourself in 10 years? It's almost like the insinuation was, 
this frivolous activity of music will one day collapse and then what you're going to do for a proper job it just felt like the same kind of patronising shit that you used to get at school when they're like oh Jamie it's not job staying like what's it going to be I actually remember that that was the turning point for me when that kind of question was asked in that kind of snarky manner and I was like I'm going to be a record producer and I actually thought to myself kind of am going to give it a go I reckon because this energy I'm getting in this room is like I'm not going to I'm going to do it. Do you know what I mean? It was a weird moment where it did actually take, you know, it's not like Be Minded, but it took a certain kind of pushback or it took a certain kind of trigger to make me kind of realise my own heart's desire, as it were. It's like I really wanted to do this thing, but I kind of needed a bit of an arse to mm. tell me I couldn't do it or, you know what I mean? I needed oh, yeah. that. Not everyone needs that. I mean, but I need that. I kind of, I, I do, I do thrive, I think, on a little bit of a, a combination of people telling me I can't do something, <laughs> like it can't be done, or you can't do this, or you're not good enough, or whatever. <laughs> I mean, it's all interesting, all this psychological shit, isn't it? Mm. But it all factors in massively to, to doing stuff. Yeah. <laughs> where was this? Where were you? Where did you grow up? It was Hinchingbrook School in uh, Huntingdon, Cambridgeshire. Yeah. I don't know that area that well, like Cambridgeshire. It's a sort of, what is it, how would you typify it? <laughs> it's relatively dull. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's an East Anglian kind of vibration. EP. Somewhere between Alan Partridge and Adam Buxton. Oh, well, I mean, that's a... Yeah, actually, no, th those are the highlights. That's the, there's some East Anglian highlights by, by, by all means. And, you know, in, in, looking back at it now from... My current vantage point, it, it was kind of like a safe, secure um, environment to bring up a kid. Um, and we were close to London. We were an hour away. It was easy to get to London. London was amazing, but I think it probably would have blown my mind. I have a village mindset. I grew up in a tiny hamlet, you know, of a few hundred people, to be honest. So I, I'm... I'm I'm still there, I think, in a lot of ways. I make every place into a village. So um, I did that in Berlin. I did that in New York. I've done that in Nashville. It's easy to do that here because it's kind of like that here. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely um, they're kind of that flat-ish world. You know, I, I loved going to Scotland when my granddad lived and just sort of mountains were just mind-blowing to me. Just the contrast of a of a hilly world was just like, oh, this is utter magic. I think that's what it did to me a little bit. It was quite, relatively speaking, quite flat. Um, but, you know. Did your folks, did they buy you the, the gear? Like you had a 950 and something else. Like yeah, that, my grandma left me, um, I don't know, there's like an inheritance of like £2,000. That's what I had when I was like 15. And it was like, you know, you can spend it whatever you want. And I was like, wow, I've never had money like this before. And uh, I got it all from Sweetwater in America because the exchange rate was so favourable. That's it. That it was like two to one or whatever. So I could get really a lot. I can, um, so yeah, I bought that. I bought an S950. I had an Atari ST, which I got off my granddad because he wasn't using it. And I badgered him like crazy. Amazing. I think that was that. I think that was the story with that. I might, that's a Commodore 64, actually. I don't know how the ST came to me. And maybe my uncle. But yeah, it was a lot of like, <laughs> I, I, I chose wisely. Like I spent a long time making that initial gear purchase. And, you know, I had a 58, I had a little Tascam 4-track, had the Lisa's MIDI Verb, the S950 and a Korg M1. I mean, that's a lot of gear for 2,000 bucks, man. That is a lot of gear. For, that's a what lot year, of gear. If you don't mind me asking, what year was this? So, yeah, I was 16, so yeah, it's about 1988, 1989. I mean, a glorious time, but you were buying the, like, you were buying the new kit at that point. Yeah, you were, you were like, I was buying a new gear, yeah. What's that, you know... I don't, yeah, like it. breezing past the 101s, the 2 3s, 3 3s, <laughs> like 9 I would have loved an analog thing though. It would have changed me a lot if I'd had an analog synth early, to be honest. Hindsight is 2020. Ah, it dude, it would have just been, yeah, it was a bit crappy in a way, that kind of. I mean, the S950 is, was the saving grace. Mm. Like that taught me 
that I wanted to make music. It's so interesting because I remember when I first got it, I was like, what do you do with this thing? <laughs> it's that, you know, I knew that you could sound, I didn't really, the appeal of an instrument that made sound straight away was way greater. Like I didn't know how to build sounds with a sampler when I first got it at like 15, 16, and obviously pre-YouTube and everything. So it was hard to know how to get the most out of it. And it, getting a sound in from the external world really often just meant, you know, CDs or something like that. Um, so yeah, when I first started to get actual sounds that I, were really juicy, it was like probably, I mean, it just took a while. But mm. then I started to just love samplers and it was just all about samplers. <laughs> and it still is basically <laughs> for I mean, me. Uh, yeah. I just I mean, love samplers so much. There's no greater studio tool, I think. Isn't that not the sort of... Yeah. I was, I was listening to Art of Noise earlier and just kind of remarking. It was like on the wikipedia page it was like the art of noise was conceived uh, in the wake of the invention of the fairlight sampler and it's like oh yeah like 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 you can't have the art of noise unless you have the fairlight and it's like how interesting that, that a device is so directly responsible for the possibility of a band you know yeah no I, of course i mean I, oh not of course but yeah i mean it is a limitless tool in that anything you hear can be manipulated and, and play back. I mean, that's just tremendous. I mean, having this reel-to-reel -reel and everything, of course, that was sort of like the dream of Music Concrete in a way, wasn't it? It was just like a very cumbersome tool. The sampler was the ultimate concrete device, and, you know, I will forever be a concretin. So I'm, I'm comfortable... <laughs> oh, that's good. I'm comfortable in that land. <laughs> Now, I can't take credit for that. That was my old pal, uh, Pablo Fiasco, who came up with that. We had a little crew called the Concretins, and it was a, it was a happy, happy zone. But, um, yeah, man. I mean, that's it. The, I think just control, the fascination of tone, composition, like all of it just kind of it comes together with a sampler, doesn't it? You can just... It's a freeing device and it's a very nice sort of punk device because it's kind of like you can sample anything. Nothing is sacred. If you can put it on this thing, it's yours to play with. It's like, really? Yeah, anything. Mm. It's like, I love that. I'd like that kind of, it took away in a way a lot of snobbery of like, yeah, but you haven't got a nah, nah, nah. But It's like, yeah, but I got a sampler. Yeah. It's like, oh, that's true. And it kind of, obviously, the S950 imparted its own colour, which I didn't know at the time. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I know. And that was, a, that was the gateway drug, really. And it's still, to this day, I am sort of looking for the next sampler. I think I've, oh, um, I've, I've not found it yet. I have a lot of them. <laughs> uh, but I, I still haven't found my dream sampler. I, hopefully one day Dave Rossman will put like a, a little bit of a next level touch on the assimilator and uh, you know I like the assimilator but it's a pain the screen is too small man you want the bang but with no pain like yeah ultimately Ableton is is the best a sampler and it? it's like watching Ned Rush use the Ableton sampling like oh, this is it this is where it was all heading but you're in the computer and there's that thing like I mean obviously I don't have to tell you but I've been trying to make videos a little bit and it's like just that consciousness of looking at the screen, you're like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> this screen, like, it's like, this is obscene. But I mean, that kind of really deeply upsets me. The shrine of the computer screen is, I mean, whatever, it's, it's hard to sidestep it. But um, I like the idea of, of, of not having to bow to it every time. And I was so free, I feel like, when I did make music on those samplers and they had their limitations or whatever, it was cool. The problem with Ableton, of course, is there are no limits. And, and I think, in a way, you want quite hard limits in your sampler. S9, SP1200 or whatever, MPC60, like, you want limited space in a way. <laughs> it sort of changes it when the space isn't a limit because then you're just all of a sudden... It's back to this kind of impossible thing of like everything's possible and like what are you going to do when everything's possible question, you know what I mean? Mm. Yeah, if you can only fit, like if you only got two megs of sample, like 750 kilobytes, yeah, you, you can, can just chill, relax. Fill it up yeah. and just go, I haven't got any more and make it. I listened back to tracks. I did a track called Freely Freaking or like an EP called Freely Freaking in 1996 on Mosquito Records. That was made 
I had no or I had no way to record to the computer aside from bounce the entire thing down to that. I had no digital audio workstation, whatever. It was just MIDI. Um, and there's all these sections coming in off the 950 where I resampled the track and it's all vibratoed out and it's playing on top of itself and it's phasing and it's like, geez, it was all happening in the S950. There's so much out of it. It's like, I can't actually remember how I did it. It's just like, it was blowing my mind to listen back to it now going like, I was so capable of kind of coaxing worlds out of that thing. It didn't feel like it had an edge to me then, mm. you know? And, and I think it is interesting, that idea of edges and stuff. I mean, we hear it, hark, people hark on about it all the time, you know, you need limits to be creative and la, la, la. And it's hard sometimes you go, yeah, yeah. I almost sometimes go, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and because how are you going to enforce that on yourself? You need a sort of a B-minder thing. <laughs> you should have B-minder like hooked up to like some kind of internet of things. If You know, if you click on the computer, then it's five bucks. It's sort of like if we're going to train ourselves like animals, it's sort of like a little bit like, you know, BT sort of seems to be involved with that kind of thing and ultimately, right? It's like, how are you going to be the person you want to be? You've got to be disciplined, man. Like Sun Ra's favorite word was discipline, which is a weird idea for a free jazzer. But, you know, he knew that <laughs> there's the only way you're going to really get the stuff done and not just piss about is you've got to be disciplined. So it's like, how on earth, when you've got, I mean, I think this Eurorack journey has definitely been an exercise in like the combination of my gear lustery and, you know, which is a kind of an ugly thing. I had a chat with my wife about it the other day. She's like, you just really love gear. And I was like, ah, oh, I took a real offense at it at the time. She's like, but it's just true. Cuts I was the like, deepest because oh, it's true. You know, you know that. Oh, I know. I do really like it. And I like a really well crafted microphone. I like the lights and the stupid shit. I'm such a bloke and it's like the things and it's like, you know, it's sad. There's a lot of it that's just like, I'm a sad collector. And uh, and you can get into that, just dusting off your polysynths and it's just like, mm, have you taken them out for a spin recently? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, am I going to sell them? Am I going to just go to, am I going to suddenly become a minimalist now? My junk, uh, Junkie XL or whatever. Did you see right. that guy? Oh yeah, he sold yeah, it. He all. sold off. He just reverbed his studio. He put it all into the reverb plugin, and then just got rid of it. And it, but he's got this like focused selection of like PBG. And but then the irony is that the all of the real gearheads are like, what did he keep? What did he keep? Uh, <laughs> Must get what he kept. Must <laughs> so get what funny. He, yeah, it's like yeah. Define irony. What yeah. did he keep? Actually, do you know? <laughs> well, 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 he kept the PPG, I think. And, yeah, well, right. About yeah, right. time I got one of those. But it's, uh, I know it's uh, it, it's. I want to not be sad, and you know, by that kind of discussion. But I have a good friend, Vicente, like I speak to fairly often, and uh, he's got he's Chilean, and I don't know whether that factors in, but I think it is the sort of I am naturally prone to feeling guilty. Like if I have too much stuff, guilty. If I don't do enough with the stuff, I've got guilty. Like it gets to guilt very quick, and it's like, what's with the guilt, man? <laughs> Guilt, guilt, guilt. It's like, it's bloody boring, all this guilt, you know. How about you he's just have the about, stuff? Yeah, about he's you. Saying that, yeah, he's saying yeah, that. Yeah, you're a guilty man. Yeah, stop the guilty talk, because it's just, it's pretty tiresome, and you know where it comes from, and it's not a good place. You know, I'm talking about the origins of that guilty mindset, you know, it's a, it's a shitty place to be. I mean, you know, it's, uh, there are other ways to just sort of not worry so much, even if you're not using everything you've got. But, I mean, I think Junk Excel's thing, I can resonate with that. It's like you walk into a room with all your stuff, and it can just be overwhelming. You're just like, oh, geez. <laughs> well, that's I don't multiple know what to rooms, do. isn't it? I mean, it's like when you've got more than one room, I think that's like, I mean, <sighs> it's, I think it's just if you, if you can, like Aphex Twin. Yeah. Um, it yeah, all yeah. comes back to our dear Rick, old Rick James. What he does is he uses it in bits. He selects it like a library. So for him, it's it's like I've got everything ever made. I have the finest taste in all, you know, the finest synths available to humanity. But he doesn't use them all at once. He picks up his laptop and he like walks over to his little cluster and he slaps his laptop down and his sound devices recorder and he's 
plugs it into the Midas and then he just makes tunes on that particular rig. And then he, you know, and that rig might just be like, uh, you know, whatever, uh, what does he use? Like the, the that Yamaha sampler and sort of, you know, a Prophet 5 and a exactly. you know, CS80 and he'll have some gorgeous like algorithmic reverb, like, a, you know, something you've never heard of. You're like, what? <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, like Ursa, you know, it makes Ursa Major Space Station look like a sort of McDonald's sort of, um, you know, Happy Meal toy. Never. Um, yeah, so. don't talk about the Ursa like that. That's oh, my dream. Just, that's, I that's love the Ursa. That's, that's a joke. But, yeah, but there you go. You 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 tapping into my gear lustry. That that the the Ursa. I'm actually getting my publishing back. Like I've had that in repair since June of last year. <laughs> Well, it's, I mean, scary. Digital stuff is scary because it's, it's just so scary. it's going to break. Only one guy in a permanent that can way. fix it. Jonathan Praga over in France. You know, I had to mail it to France. And then getting it back has been a palaver. Like then, you know, yeah, it isn't. It's heady. I mean, the AMS is like this, the time modulator, like the prime time, like, my favorite boxes, but they are, yeah, there's a clock is ticking on them. <laughs> like it's a horrible thought, but the clock is ticking on all of us. I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And I, I, I'm, I'm more, yeah, I suppose I could take the Junkie XL thing. I could have sold the Publishing right now because it's, it's worth so much money right now. Like sound gas, or you know, it was all it was all happening. But mm. I was like, yeah, but <sighs> then I'll use the reverb on it, and I'll really use it because it's such a weird twangy metallic piece of turd. But it's so cool, you, know, you can't get it any other way. So you're like, if you love sound, then that's it. That's what you do, isn't it? You do silly things. As long as you but, use yeah, it, exactly. Yeah, as, long as, as long as you, you use actually... it. I like to say when I'm making the pods, for example, I constantly use my AMS and my time modulator because they're right here and I just have them patched in the cool way. So I can just go, oh, just throw it through AMS. Oh, it sounds amazing. Like throw, throw this vocal through. And I'd mu so much rather do that than do plugins. I'm actually just as quick with them the way they're configured. So it's, it's really about that, isn't it? And they get used all the time. So like they're, they're right there and other things are way too far away. <laughs> And so, in a way, it's just like, how come that's so far away? Maybe you don't need it. But no, it, that's you need the thing. To, like, I don't know, hire someone to like come into your studio and just reorder things in the night, uh, in See, the morning. It seems like the Afix thing. It's almost like, yeah, it's almost like you have all your gear in a sort of randomizer, and you can just kind of get the computer to randomize it out and say, what am I going to make music with today? Five items or less. <laughs> it's like yeah it just all ends up just being preamps and you're like oh shit <laughs> yeah yeah but then you do something like a like sick sort of mixer feedback thing and like, yeah exactly you have to do it i mean that would be a cool little that's not a bad studio tool it's like there typing you go. all the gear you've got and just sort of say computer come up with a weird configuration i have to use to make this track and it will be awesome if you do that i mean i'm, I'm pretty convinced that would be super cool there is um but there's a new Moog thing called these sound studios, which is like a combination of a Mother 32 and a DFAM, but in a in like a pre-packaged box. And there's one that's like a subharmonicon and a DFAM in a pre-packaged box. And it, and as part of it, it comes with um patching dice. And it comes in the the patching dice come in a little cardboard box and you lift the flap open and they show you the ins and the outs of all of the devices, and they're all numbered with dice numbers and so what you do is you roll the dice and there's a black dice and a, a white dice and that the they're configured so that only ins go to in outs and outs go to ins and so by rolling the dice it will give you a valid patch that you can attempt and i was like that's, that's great isn't it it's very difficult designing project products where you're like what people want and what they would use like i spoke to um well, Tom Whitwell, who you know from the music thing, is oh, like it's his great. Job. That interview is so good. Yeah, and it's, it's that idea. It's like what people say they want versus what they actually would use. Is yeah, yeah. I yeah, don't. Yeah. I think. I think if you design synths, there's always got to be an element. I don't know how much these companies actually test them. Do you know what I mean? Like how much they get yeah. like a sort of musician and put them in like a cage and then <laughs> feed them only with <laughs> that the always synth. Works well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, do it. Do the funk thing. Write good music and we'll give you food. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, just better with the configuration in this way or in it. It's like, they don't do that, I don't think. So, and that's why, you know, if you're a designer, I think there's always a degree of kind of, you know, what you feel is intuitively. And I, I don't know. It's, so you're saying they don't put enough musicians in cages? <laughs> no. 
I'm so sorry, I, you know I live in America with that cage talk <laughs> you can well, no, yeah it's a little it's a little close to home unfortunately <laughs> yeah um, but I mean, yeah, no, I know what you mean. It, it, it's tricky, isn't it? Because you've got people on one hand, like Soma making the Pulsar, right? And he's like thinking outside the box and everyone's so excited about it because like, oh, at last. So you can't just do something outside the box and it's shit sounding. So you need to be clever because you, if it sounds tremendous, but it's a little bit hard to get the sound out you'll be willing to try to get that tremendous sound out. If at the end of the day, you just can't, if it's like a crappy granular algorithm and it's just not good fundamentally, mm. you know, it might have the greatest UI ever made, but, you know, I think if you work first and foremost with an incredible sound, it, it just, it, sometimes having a, a, a bit more of an obtuse way to get to it kind of makes it cooler. Because then you're just like, oh, I'm discovering the thing, like folk tech vibes or whatever, you know, mm. something a bit more esoteric in terms of how to get the thing. There's a place for that. But maybe it's just not a mass place. It's not the sort of same sort of place that makes the Juno 60 like such a big seller and such an easy yeah. no-brainer for like, hey, can you get the thing that goes, Wah. he's like, yeah, dial this patch up, do the thing. Wah. And it's sort of like that whole thing of like, filling in it's like basically like when you're buying a guitar do you get the really crazy one with the weird tuners or do you just buy a strat you know mm. it's sort Maybe of like, like the robot tuners on yeah the, so it's sort of like yeah. of course most of the time the strat or a tally will sort of or and then you have three flavors and they pretty much do the thing and it's like that in in instrument design for synth really even though it ought not to be. Well, then, are you, are you, when you were saying that, it was making me think of the Make Noise Strager. And as I was coming over in the... I was driving to pick up a balance bike for my son. And I was listening to the, the latest uh, Hanging Out With Audio Files. Uh, I recommend that you wise, check it wise, out. Wise, yeah, yeah, very yeah, wise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you get a chance to or check it out. <laughs> but where you were playing the Strager, and it was interesting hearing what you were coming up with it, and I was like, fuck, that's how... And there was a bit where you put, like, drum beats through it, and I, I literally was, like, in my car, I just went, fuck, that sounds really good. Like, mm. that sounds great. Yeah. And I never got that sound out of it when I had it, do you know what I mean? And it's... Right. You also, when you did the acid with it, when you did the acid with it, I was like, that sounds fucking really great as well. I never got that sound out of it. I was like, I missed a whole... Did I miss a whole side of it? And it's... And it's exactly as you just said, because that's quite an obtuse piece of equipment and it, yeah. it lends itself to one thing, which is hell doom drone. But if you right. can, right. if you just work against, not work against it, but if you just go with a little bit of an applied approach, then suddenly you discover it's like, fuck, it's capable of this insane, like wicked, like distorted, gnarly killer. I liked doing that thing and... and well, I don't know if it's you that told me about the voltage block, using the voltage block as a kind of recall device. Mm, probably not. I haven't got Dude, one. Dude, like, what? It is a silly that, thing. Yeah. I've never used it like that. It's such a useful device because I what I ended up doing is like putting one of those catalysts, you know, the crossfader, and just basically taking the full range of that crossfader CV out and putting it into the CV in of the voltage block, but then sort of using that therefore to quantize that full crossfade motion. So you kind of, it steps over the range of the crossfader. So then you can take each of those stepped ranges and just find a delay time in the Strega that was a uh, rhythmic value. And you go in between like, essentially, it was like having an electribe that's always like, you know, hmm. yeah, rhythmically yeah. in time. And that was just a huge thing for me because then I could just be like, jam this and pull the slider over and it's like, yes, you know it's going to be in time because the Strager's delay is so wild that it's not really good for rhythmic stuff. So just that kind of forcing you to sort of think about what it's missing and what you could do to maybe use your system. I mean, you've taught me so much of stuff like that. It's like, look at what you've got. is a huge thing with module, isn't it? It's like, Oh, if only there was a box to recall presets. And I was like, hang on, the voltage block is... I don't like it as a that thing where you're... I don't like it for the usual use, particularly. I don't not dislike it, but I've never loved it. Because, again, it's, it locks me into... It's just like, it's too quick. The loop just goes around... It's too soon. It's not enough stages to make it that interesting to me. But... um but having it CV addressable as a kind of preset storage device, that's really sweet. Because then it's eight voltage values per step to recall. And that's a lot. Yeah, that's more a lot. than you can do on the pressure points or whatever. 
Unless you have like the all the expanders or whatever. Yeah, you know. yeah. So yeah. anyway, that was that was cool. Yeah, I know. But I love what you got out of the Strager as well. I barely patched it to be honest. I patched the most prosaic envelopes into all of the, you know, the filters and the, and the amp stuff, and just kind of got on with that. You know, mm. yeah, but yeah, but it's, it's, it's a cool box. It's like wait, well, and it's simple and yet here's two very different approaches and it's the Heimbach's too Heimbach's did something really way different I didn't get those sounds I wasn't exactly. really compelled by some of them and and it's just what draws you in isn't it but that is also what you say there about some people like I'm reading the comments and there's some people like yeah I haven't really been blown away by what you know what I've heard from this thing and, yeah you know it's sort of that's and it's an interesting thing it's just like I don't know it not everything's for everyone. Not everything is ever going to be, you know, all things to all people. But I don't know. It's the idea that there's, uh, I don't know what I'm trying to say, whether people just write things off because they can't see their own. I had another example of this where I did that video on the quadranted swarm and I was like, and I, was, I all I did was I, I got the thing and was like, this is weird. Like, I don't understand this at all. When I, it was like the Strager. I looked at the panel. I was like, this doesn't make any sense. I don't know what this makes. I, I, I hadn't read anything. I hadn't watched any videos. They just sent it to me. It was like, can you come up with something with this and make a video about it? And then what happened was that I just started playing and then I had the little TR09 and I just hooked it up to that. So I had a 909 and it, I was like, oh, Fuck me. Like, it was just a moment when it was like, when it did. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I was like, like, that, is a, that is a choice, pick up And I was like, oh my God, this is really good for that. And, then, and isn't it cool when you're sometimes just patching and you just happen to come across the right modules to pair with it almost thinking like, yeah, oh, this could be cool. And it's like, oh shit, I chose the perfect pairing with this thing. It's like it's all of a sudden it comes to life. And then just that one breakthrough into the box is like, okay, well, if this works, will it work with this as well? It's like, yes, it will. And then all of a sudden the pe the puzzle pieces come together and you sort of see it for how you want to use it. And like, uh, I just love that. I mean, uh, I was speaking to Alessandro Cortini, whatever, like the other day, like for, for a pod that's coming up and, um, he was like, doesn't like Eurorack because, you know, it gives him too much anxiety, he was saying, you know, even though behind him is a massive book or whatever. But, uh, you know, it wasn't in that case, but I know that he has it. And uh, I was sort of almost saying, like, the opposite, like, but the booklet kind of gives me that. I mean, even though it's got that very undeniable or compelling tone, it just also feels like there's a lot of um, learning curve with it. And it's, it's all, it's all. Isn't it? He feels the opposite, doesn't he? He's like, I know that book class so well, I, yeah. I feel comfortable. It's like a dressing gown. I do I stick the same thing when I see booklets, but it's only because I don't understand them. And then I look at them, I'm like, there's not that much to these modules. I'm pretty sure that just as I've learned how a make noise mask works, I could work out a of course. You know, quad of course. Gate or whatever. Yeah, I do remember going to NAM and like trying out, oh, there was like, you know, a bunch of. Eurorack people, and then there was one little booklet, like the, you know, the new 208C, the little command station with the MIDI on it and stuff. And so I gave that a whirl, and I must say, <laughs> it kind of, it, it kind of had that inherent tone, that even though that's not like one of the glorious boxes from back in the day, it still had this pretty undeniable tone. It's like the bonk. You know, and you look at someone like, you know, floating points or whatever, and it's, it's a beautiful tonal output. Yeah, and that thing definitely does. It also makes techno and amazing. I can see why Surgeon's got one of those because I'm like, it does, especially it's five step and it phases and there's just and it's yeah, just Eamon like, Tobin's got all that as well, and it's like yeah, I know, man. That's that's uh, once that well, yeah, it's serious for looking at them all. I don't know though. It's funny. Well, I got all the Surge stuff first when I got Eurorack because I think I wanted to sort of be in that pure land of voltage, and although it did appeal and I made some really cool squiggles. I was like, after a while, I was like, hmm, you know, I've currently using the surges to sort of do a polysynth that I've kind of left permanently patched, which has been a hell of an endeavor. Uh, so I'm not touching it because <laughs> just the patching that's gone on has is, is been immense. It's um, rather decadent, though, like making a polysynth from surges. Yeah. Yeah, there's three NTOs and uh, and uh, one of those wavetable oscillators, the... Uh, 352 or whatever and uh some reason it's a glorious thing man it's just uh, i just love it yeah i mean it took me so long to build i thought i'm not going to take it down 
That's basically the bottom line <laughs> for now. And because every time cause I can turn on the circle on, going back and full circle away, set it to like the Hermod patch, and then basically I'm playing the polysynth and it comes straight out of the uh, the Bafaco or whatever, and I can put my effects on it, and I'm just playing straight away, like no messing around. I've got four precision adders, so I can change the the relative voicings of like all the octaves and all that with I've got those T43s I've got like four of those for one for each voice and uh it's just really pretty fast to get to a polysynth sound that I I truly made in a way so even if it might not be the perfect poly for every job I'm more attached to it cuz I'm like this is my synth you know I really made this one like uh it's got like uh vibrato with vibrato speed control and amount and onset delay and like you know and i've got the you know the poly end preset to kind of bring in envelope presets like on a, on a preset synth so i can do the filter and amplitude envelopes as presets so i can kind of just pull up sounds in a way <laughs> i think this is isn't this how right. colin bender started as well he was like i, I you know i just wanted to make a, a poly synth yeah and so yeah 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 bought, bought a wall of modular yeah, yeah, and which it does sort of, it's it's a really fun challenge in a way, isn't it? Well, it's not fun. It's, uh, no, it's not in any way fun. So it's really, it's really yeah, it really work. gives you a lot of respect. I mean, the Hermod's been great because it does all the voice stealing and does all the conversion of MIDI and, you know, I can't get more than four voices out of it if I want to have velocity, um, which I'm going to actually get. But anyway, you know, mm. don't need to tell you about all of that. It's just definitely a whole side of my case is just this polysynth, which I could easily just get rid of. <laughs> But, could, do you, but are you actually composing with it? Is it is it being useful? Do you know what I mean? Or is it is it just a thing of to do uh, to learn from? Uh, I mean, yeah, I've I've made a lot of composing with it. I suppose kind of goes back to sort of what I, my doom, my nights. I mean, a lot of it, like uh, having this reel to reel and having this kind of whole system that I've been working on, and like I think that that has been a missing piece of the puzzle for me. Like uh, wanting to get away from the computer, but not having a kind of you no. Know, now the tape with this with this uh, loop setup I've got, it is my master clock. The tape, which is just truly bonkers, and I just love it. Um, but I can do sound on sound recordings from the poly synth, and uh, just keep like layering it on the tape, and that combination of flexibility and switching between the when I switch between the modes and the circle, and I can. There's a mode that will change the speed of the tape, and there's and there's a mode that will drum me back to my polysynth. You know what I mean? So I can just kind of like quickly kind of zoom around like those two worlds, and that has been really amazing because they're stationed physically close to one another, and it, all of that is is part of it. Just the flow of it all. I've got my I've started to hit upon a little bit of a constant setup in the studio. And it's taken a long time to get here. You know, I've got my little Mellotron D, like, which is really great because it's got a big black back surface. So I can rest the reel-to-reel -reel on top of it. So, and then the poly thing is right next door to that. So they're all there. I've got the little Moog pedal, like, and that's controlling the tape. And it all somehow talks. Actually, on the circle, how can you, how do you do a thing where you can have, like, I want the, the Moog pedal to always send to the tape like i always want it to be hard rooted you know you always have that select button yeah is there a way to not make it on edit track so there is always... a, i'm pretty sure there is a midi yeah. through on it where you can like root something just goes straight so for example you can use like uh sysx controllers and always feed them through to like your synth i'm pretty sure there is a midi really? through but yeah, i yeah, couldn't tell you that. <laughs> exactly. that would be that'd be that'd be amazing check the ring binder exactly yeah but, you know, yeah. So, so in, to answer your question, do I use it to make music? Yes. It sounds like you're building to something. Like There's a kind of, like, like, like you say, you've not been producing albums, but there's clearly something that is percolating. I'm homing in on something. I am, I trend, uh, like, I have been writing a song. I often write songs with my wife, you know, we'll collaborate. Um, we've done that a fair bit, and I love doing that, and... There's a song that's ongoing at the moment, and I've been like a bit like you. I think you've been getting to the piano, am I right? I'm trying to, uh, but I, again, I don't have time for lessons. That's the problem. <laughs> well, I don't have time to practice. 
and then I, the, and then of course the guilt comes in quickly because I'm like I haven't practiced bloody piano <laughs> yeah but I have learned a lot I've learned, I've learned so much more than I give myself credit for I think sometimes um, and just having that ability to play a phrase take it over and not actually sequence but just play it you know without the, without having to bloody track all the notes and nudge them and just like just play it even if it's rough and ready I like that freedom of just being able to sort of think of it as like it's not not in control in that way um so I could I took the polysynth and I kind of expanded the main theme of the song that was written on piano and it was all it was glorious you know just because I was like ah oh, it's this is the phrase I was playing on the piano and it works so well on the poly but it has a whole new dimension and I was like, I was really just, yeah, pretty happy with it because it's, yeah, it just, it all of a sudden came together, I suppose, in that moment. And I was like, this is, this is a way for me to have a little bit of a sound palette that might represent like an album, mm. for example, just sort of saying yeah. like, that would be a good palette, not a limited one, um, but not, a, not an endless one because the patch will be set up and I wouldn't fuck with the patch. You know, I, I, I would maybe a little bit, but not a lot. <laughs> and I'd maybe just use the combination of effects and make that the thing that's the wild card aspect. You know what I mean? Just like mm. run it through the Strager for this one, run it through yeah. the Strager going into like a tape delay, and that would be the color change, but the source would be the same. Like, like having your strat and then pedals, basically. Yeah, exactly. It's not like you, you know, if you have a violin, you don't restring it for every song. Um, yeah. So I think having that mindset might be my limit, might be my limitation. But um, who knows? It remains to be seen because that song has been going on for about um, um, three weeks now. <laughs> and I've left it kind of like, yeah, dwindling on the drive. But I mean, I finished the first sketch of it in a few hours and it's pretty much what ends up being the vocal take or whatever. And then I'm just like, why am I not finishing this thing? So anyway, yeah. Just need a B minder, I think. I do, you right. do need a yeah. B minder on my ass. That's you know, well, the, I'll let you decide whether you make a pact with your credit card. I like it. I like it. I, it is really, yeah, consequences. I know, yeah, exactly. It's got to be a, a consequence. I suppose then that just leaves the final question of what is the future of music technology? sounds like you're trying to build something that's the future of your music technology, but it doesn't necessarily involve futuristic tech. It could be old tech for you. I mean, if it's a, if it's retrofitting an Atari so that it can, it can respond to CV and MIDI, that feels like that's some sort of circular futuristic and past thing. Well, it's funny because I've got those gloves. I've got those Mimu gloves, um, the Image and Heat ones, because I'm trying to do a project with the marimba player across the road. I like a fusion of acoustic sound origin with, uh, with digital control. Um, but I've battled with a lot of that over the years and it, it doesn't feel like it's there yet, but I, I like that. I like the, I like, I, you're right. I like those kind of, uh, co collisions of eras and collisions of mindsets it's basically my setup's like fresh for 1969 <laughs> you know what i mean it's like had they had a little bit more control in 69 they could have done i mean i'm sure mortz Butnick did all this i think he did but um and that was so it's kind of like i like that though like taking maybe looking back to much like you someone like heston blumenthal when they're trying to do new re recipes for the fat duck he'll go back to much much older cookbooks for inspiration he won't take modern ones he'll take some elizabethan shit you know mm. okay they used to do what with aspic like okay we can we can make this thing stand on a wobbly jelly i mean you know it's like i think that's kind of a nice thing way to look at the human endeavor because you know yeah someone like raymond scott he was well ahead of, ahead of the curve and he was trying to use artificial intelligence essentially wasn't he? he was trying to make a guided compositional system and he was on the right track and i think that's really where it's going to be it's going to be guided systems and uh, hopefully we'll have the sanity to guide it <laughs> It remains yeah. to be seen. 
Did you listen to that um, uh, data set who shared the um, the tune the AI that, thing that yeah, yes. which was um, which was trained on um, Donna Summer wild. and Dodger it Maroda, was wild, wasn't it? And it's like I played it. I played. I, I threw it up. I threw that up on our stereo upstairs, and I just played it. It was like Rach, my wife, and like my son Francis, and. I was like, this is it. Because I'd, I'd spoken to her about it. I was like, listen to this. And it sounds so, like, sandy. It sounds like... Yeah, the sound is weird. It sounds honestly like it's it's like it... <laughs> I mean, I've actually made a one kilobyte, one kbps MP3, and it doesn't sound like that. That, that MP3 sounds swirly. This was like... It sounds like it's in a sandstorm, but not Darude. And so, <laughs> flappily. But it's, it's... The bass line is... I had that in my head for three days, solid. Yeah. And I was like, Neh. and then it's like, ooh, baby. There's like these little like, like oh, no. embellishes at the end. And I'm like, that's good. Someone sent me something for the podcast for some, for potential music or whatever. And it was generated with open AI and a, a lyric generator and everything. And it was all, it was pretty compelling, man. I was like, I was got, I, I, one thing I can say is I've never heard anything quite like it before. And that's got that's got value in and of itself, I think. Mm. So yeah, they, let's. I mean, obviously, you had that great conversation with BT where he was kind of a little bit doomily predicting like our necess- our need to protect our you know human identity <laughs> before the algorithm thieves all of our creativity, our ideas, our choices, and that was really uh, that stayed with me that little idea. Because uh, I've had other, I'm sure you've had them as well. The companies reaching out. There's another company that takes stems and kind of like ties them all together as a sort of a, like an endless sort of um, a, a merger of your little ideas and fragments. And I'm like, actually, it suits me down to the ground because I've got a million little unloved blocks at this point, and I'm not sure if I have the energy to tie them together. Maybe an AI would do it better than me. Or with a weirder approach, it might actually yield some cool shit. So I'm all I'm all open to that. I like the idea of like, you know, letting a computer like uh, have a go, have a go, at least. have a go. Yeah. yeah, maybe it's a funky machine. You know, David Bowie and and like, yeah. sure, I mean, maybe Prince. Cut I don't ups. know. If Prince Prince did this, but he, he did cut ups. But he also had session musicians. You know, and they would come in, and it would be okay for them to come oh, up with ideas. Absolutely. So why isn't it okay for, you know, your, your Intel i7 CPU to, to... Yeah, I mean, ultimately, you still have to... You have to, yeah, yeah. You have to still have to approve it, don't you? I mean, I did see some kind of slightly terrifying NFT thing that someone was posting the other day where it was completely... Com- the NFT itself was derived from a robot that they taught how to paint. <laughs> so they taught a robot how to paint, and then the painting became an NFT. So it was like... Do you have to play like, the robot? Uh, exactly. What is going on? There's some sort of aspects of it that quickly go into some dystopian poo-poo, don't they? Like, <laughs> it's just like, yeah, then you just want to ditch it all and just kind of become a farmer. And so there's always there's always that. Yeah, I want to sort of like bang two rocks together. Just. Yeah, it might just turn into just clave, the ultimate <laughs> musical instrument. <laughs> But yeah, yeah man, it's gonna shout into a cave just to feel something <laughs> yeah. real, you know. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. Oh man, well, thank you, thank you, and sorry Wait. for the tech woes that delayed this. Do not, late for in you, any man. way, do not apologise for tech woes. Uh, you know me; I'm always guilty. There's always a layer of guilt to this. Like I feel like I haven't given you enough, Alex. I feel I like I haven't like given you enough oh, like no, entertainment. No, no, no. Oh no, 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 that's not good. how it works. Be well, good, 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 and, and you, man, do your thing. Thank you. Jamie Liddell, folks. Fresh for 1969, that studio possibility. Interesting. It's in- I've felt so much kinship talking to Jamie, not to say that I'm anywhere the musician of as Jamie, but there's a sort of, there's a many things in his habits and the way that he sort of 
does things that that resonate with me like you know even down to him saying you know he got some inheritance from his gran when he was 16 and spent it on music gear that's that's what i did when i'm not my gran but my great uncle when i was 16 i inherited some money when he passed away and that got me my first music equipment so it's um i've talked about that before isn't it funny how just like you know one random gift like that a big gift a massive gesture can just change a life in a way because gear is it is expensive even if you buy it from Sweetwater and you know 1988 1989 amazing that absolutely amazing like getting it all shipped over amazing it must all have been like the wrong voltage anyway uh, not important um, but yeah I really enjoyed that and I hope that you did too it's a free form conversation with a person who's obviously a conversationalist himself being a podcaster I also love that Jamie ended the podcast for me he like wrapped it up as if I was his <laughs> guest <laughs> I was like that's brilliant you've done my job for me thank you very much mate um yeah that uh, yeah it's funny I'm sort of thinking about the things that we talked about that that bloody AI tune. When I was editing this podcast, and I recorded this a few months ago, I thought to myself, I can still hum the bass line from that AI generated tune. I can play it in my head right now and hear it and I can hum the bass line. And it's, it's now months and months and months since I listened to it. And that was generated by a computer. It's just like good grief. If you ever thought the idea that a computer could write music that would be catchy and as good as a human being, I do think that time will prove that that's just a thing. A computer can absolutely do some of the same things that human beings can do, you know, in an approximate way. And, you know, it does take a human to choose which bit you hear. That's obviously the whole like tenet of generative music is you can take credit for the things that you allow to be on the record because they're lens through your own taste. And in effect, therefore, isn't it like you wrote them because you chose what was good or bad? You know, you rejected everything else. It was specific, the bit that you chose, and therefore it's truly yours. Someone else might have chosen a different little bit. So yes, I really identified with Jamie and his sort of, his plight in a way, because it felt like he was, he's struggling with the, the oh God, with the, and if you're listening to this now, Jamie, so I'm not psychoanalyzing you, um, but just I identify with it because I too pootle around. I pootle when it comes to making music. It's really hard if you don't have a deadline. And that's why that B minder thing is so sort of powerful for me because it's there's too many things, too many plates spinning. I've got other obligations like making bloody videos and podcasts, you know, which I've kind of which I've made for myself. It's totally fine, but it's it does mean that finding time to do things like music and especially complete music is really hard. You do need a deadline. And it could be that that deadline is, or probably has to be, self-imposed. Like, we're not signed, or many of us are not. Um, I'm not, so <laughs> I would have to just do it of my own bat. So, I don't know, book the mastering engineer like um, uh, like Matthew Herbert did, or get on Beeminder, which I definitely recommend. Um, it's worked for me, and it's got me off my butt to do some exercise, at the very least. It really has helped in that regard just keeps you you know uh, it's just like a f sort of whip that just keeps you like focused like, oh god yeah no okay i can't i actually can't forget about that otherwise my bank account will start hemorrhaging so <laughs> brilliant um yeah so i think that's probably all that we have time for today I am, as I say, in a state of flux. And so I've not been able to produce videos um, in the way that I would like to. Apologies for this. And thank you for those who are bearing with me in this process. Um, but I am creating a kind of like temporary setup where I can make videos, but just in a really small place. I mean, actually, it's not. I've been making do with an exceptionally small space for the last two years. But point is, I just need to create a new exceptionally small space with some slight tweaks to make it workable in this space. So that is happening. However, and in fact, the first video is going to be a demo of the Intelligel Metropolis. Yes, I have got one and I'm going to be making a video of it 
Um, it's really good. As I was talking to Jamie about, uh, obviously Jamie's got one too. It's just bonkers. It's like an Excel you know, big whopper version of the metropolis where you've got, you know, it's the same kind of core function and sort of principles that are in play. It's not sort of radically different in that sense at its heart, but it's got all this extra stuff added to it, all this like self-modulation capabilities. What is really good with it is that you can, you can sort of extend the eight steps in different ways because you have like accumulators where every time it cycles round, as Jamie mentioned the accumulators, it will add a voltage to it. So you can have like a note that gets higher every time it cycles round and then loops back round. Funnily enough, something that is awesome in the circlon, as we said, but um, amazing. So we're going to have fun, you and I, <laughs> jamming and getting some acid going with that soon. And so I thank my sponsors, that is the ever lovely Signal Sounds and the ever wonderful Skillshare. Get yourself some learning, go click the link, go to Signal Sounds, buy stuff if you need stuff and mainly thank you. I hope wherever you are, you are safe. I hope you are getting a little bit of sunshine, not too much, just a little bit. And I will see you soon. Please consider sponsoring on Patreon. That is patreon.com forward slash Mylar Melodies. And tell your friends about this podcast if you enjoyed it. Thanks very much. I'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>